tonight's video, we're going to be doing a week 9 NFL recap, as well as a week 10 NFL waiver wire pickups. So, if you're interested in the waiver wire section of this video, I'll leave timestamps time down below that you can go click ahead and check out. So, if you're here for the recap, uh, welcome. We're going to start off with Thursday Night Football, a matchup between the Houston Texans and the New York Jets. In this game, we saw the Jets take down the Texans with a final score of 21-13, a surprising victory. In this game, C.J. Stroud goes 11 of 30 for 191 yards. Joe Mixon has 24 carries for 106 yards and a touchdown, and Tank Dell has 6 catches for 126 yards. For the Jets, we have Aaron Rodgers, 22 of 32 for 211, 3 touchdowns. Brees Hall has 15 carries for 74 yards, and Devontae Adams with his best game as a Jet, 7 catches for 91 yards and a score. My key takeaways from this game, a game in which the Houston Texans had 322 yards of offense to the 293 of the Jets. For the Texans, it would have to be uh, just injuries. We saw how limited C.J. Stroud was in the passing game in this one. He goes 11 of 30. That is way below his average, and it's mostly because of the injuries due to Nico Collins being out and uh, Stephon Diggs being out for the rest of the year. But Nico Collins should be back from IR shortly, so I'm not too worried if I'm a Texans fan. Uh, just know that until he is back, there may be a little bit of an offensive struggle. As for the Jets... I think, you know, this was an important victory. This was an unexpected but an important victory. And this is actually your last chance to make a run for it. You've got a, a kind of a difficult matchup this week against the Cardinals, who are at a surprising 5-4. and four. But if you can manage to take them down, your upcoming lineup is the Colts, the Seahawks, the Dolphins, and the Jaguars. Those are four very winnable games. So, say you win this week. You're sitting at four and six. Now, your, your path to even or even a positive record is not that hard. You can theoretically save your season, but you, you need to go run the table right now. After that, let's move into our Sunday slate. Our first game is going to be a matchup between the Cowboys and the Falcons. In this game, we saw the Falcons dismantle the Cowboys, taking them down 27 to 21. Uh, we... We have a lot to talk about for this one. Uh, first up, Dak Prescott goes 18 of 24 one for 131 and a touchdown. Rico Dowdle taking over for this backfield, 12 carries for 75 yards, and Jake Ferguson with 7 catches for 71 yards. For the Falcons, Kirk Cousins goes 19 of 24 for 222 and 3 touchdowns. Bichon Robinson has 19 carries for 86 yards, and Darnell Mooney leads the wide receivers with 5 catches for 88 and a touchdown. For the Cowboys, the key takeaway here is... I think that the season has officially gone down with Dak's injury. That obviously wasn't the most promising of starts. Uh, now you fall to 3-5 and five and Dak Prescott is injured. I believe it is a hamstring issue. He has been placed on IR. He will miss at least the next four weeks. It is done. I know that the last three seasons going 12-5 and five each year, it was impressive. You know, you felt like you had something. Not that much changed, but this is where it all fell apart. And I think it is time to wave the white flag. The Cowboys are not making the playoffs this year. For the Falcons, I know I've been critical of them, but this is where you can celebrate. You have the, you like that Kirk Cousins on your team, and I'm sure you are liking that at this point. Nine weeks in, you are at the top of the division. Kirk has 17 touchdown throws and 7 interceptions over those 9 weeks. That is such a step up in the quarterback play that you guys have seen in the last 2 seasons. One win away from tying the win total in like the last couple years. So hopefully I'm not jinxing it, but this is a phenomenal time to be a Falcons fan. After that, we jump into an AFC East matchup between the Miami Dolphins and the Buffalo Bills. This one was actually quite close, but in the end, the Buffalo Bills would walk away with the victory, winning 30-27 to over the Dolphins. We had Tua Tagovailoa, an extremely efficient 25-28 of 28 for 231 and two touchdowns. Devon Achan with 12 carries for 63 yards and a score, and then Tyreek Hill with four catches for 80 yards. Then we have Josh Allen going 25 of 39 for 235 yards, 
three touchdowns and one interception. James Cook with 10 carries for 44 yards, and Ray Davis leading the wide receivers and tight ends with two catches for 70 yards and a score. In this game, my key takeaway for the Dolphins has to be honestly a positive one. I think that they solidly outplayed the Buffalo Bills on offense, 373 offensive yards to 325 of Buffalo. You did well on that side of the ball, but you just could not buy a stop in the second half. It was kind of like the Titans, where in the first half you did a number, you did a great job on Buffalo, limiting them, keeping them to a low score, and then the onslaught just kept piling on, and you could not stop them when it mattered towards the end of the game. And honestly, very impressive. The offense looks so much better with Tua. You, you've competed in the last two weeks, long losing two teams with winning records, but it's been very close, so I would just keep the spirits high, keep trying. For the Bills, Josh Allen once again gets it done without Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper was added to this team. He had a couple good games, and then out for this one, he manages to get it done, but with Ray Davis topping the leaderboards for the wide receivers, you know how thin they are. It's not that good. I think Khalil Shakir had a solid game, but um, Keon Thompson, Cole, Keon Thompson, yeah, um, not that impressive of a game. And the the wide receivers, when you don't have Cooper, they are unimpressive. So you manage to get away with it here, but try your best to get Amari Cooper healthy for a late late season stretch. After that, we're going to move into a matchup between the Las Vegas Raiders and the Cincinnati Bengals. In this game, the Bengals would come out victorious with a final score of 41-24 over the Raiders. Gardner Minshew in this game goes 10 of 17 for 124. Alexander Madison goes 9 carries for 36 yards. And Jacoby Myers has 8 catches for 105 yards. For the Bengals, Joe Burrow goes 27 of 39 for 251 yards, 5 touchdowns, and 1 interception. Chase Brown with 27 carries for 121 yards. And Mike Gusecki with 5 catches for 100 yards and 2 touchdowns. Big day for the tight end there. My key takeaways for this game, if you are the Raiders, um, I'm going to be honest, I had no idea Desmond Ritter was on this team. I saw that Desmond Ritter took a lot of snaps in at quarterback, and that was a big surprise to me. I did not know he was on the roster. And still, somehow, with knowing that, I do think your worst problem is your running game. The offensive, the offense is a huge mess, first off. But quarterback play, we saw how far the Colts went with Gardner Mitchell last year, but they also had an adequate running room. I think running back situation has gotten so bad that it's honestly a worse problem than the quarterback situation. Obviously, running back is something you can address in free agency, and quarterback is something you can address in the draft, but as for this season, you're going to have to change it up, because like, how are these quarterbacks going to survive? They're all going to look horrible out there, I feel like, if you can't run the ball at all. And then, for the Bengals, uh, it's it's another mid-season assessment, you know, you're four and five. You have a tough stretch ahead. I'm not gonna lie. It's the Ravens, the Chargers, and the Steelers. These are all three teams with uh, a solid defense in one way or the other, and they're all winning teams. You have to go two and one in this upcoming stretch if you want to have a shot at the playoffs. You cannot exit this stretch being anything less than six and six, in my opinion. So this is draw by fire. You need to prove if you are a playoff team in these next three weeks. After that, we are going to have a matchup between the Chargers and the Browns, a game in which the Chargers would defeat the Browns with a final score of 27-10. to In this game, we have Justin Herbert going 20, 18 of 27 for 282 and two touchdowns, J.K. Dobbins with 14 carries for 85 yards and two touchdowns, and Quentin Johnston with four catches for 118 yards and a touchdown. For the Browns, Jameis Winston goes 26 of 46 for 235, one touchdown and three interceptions. Nick Chubb carries the ball 15 times for only 39 yards. And Cedric Toman has six catches for 75 yards and a touchdown. In my key takeaways for this game, for the Chargers, uh, honestly, I just have to 
give props. They took this defense. They made them look not that impressive compared to, I mean, this defense just took down the, the Baltimore Ravens. So to go in there, win by 17, that is impressive. My only note would be the running game does look a little bit stale. You rush for only 96 yards in this game. You've become more of a pass-heavy team in the last couple weeks. And Justin Herbert is a great quarterback, so I don't mind that. But if you want to revive the running game, get back to like the 150 yards rushing, I would give Kamani Vidal a few more nudges. You know, you're still limiting him pretty heavily. Get him more involved. Change up the looks. Get the running game slightly more back the way it was looking in weeks one and two. You can still have Justin Herbert throw for 250, but like... Don't fully move away from the running game. You only rushed at, what, 23 times? You can have that number be higher. And as for the Browns, uh, just gonna say, welcome back, Jameis Winston. This is the Jameis that we all know and love. This is, it was bound to happen at some point. He had a glorious return last week, and now he has come back down to earth. I'm not going to fault him for playing how I expect Jameis Winston to play. You're gonna have these weeks. This is a tough defense but he still produced, in some ways, Cedric Thomas still had a good day, so it's fine. You're, you're gonna have that against tough defenses, against some not so tough defenses, he'll play better, uh, the past funnel defenses, so you win some, you lose some. After that, we have an overtime showdown between the New England Patriots and the Tennessee Titans. This was one of three overtime games this week. Unfortunately, the Patriots would end up losing to the Titans with a final score of 20 to 17. In this game, Drake May goes 29 of 41 for 206 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. He also is the leading rusher for the Patriots with eight carries for 96 yards. And Hunter Henry, with seven catches for 56 yards, leads all wide receivers and tight ends. For the Titans, Mason Rudolph goes 20 of 33 for 240 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. Tony Pollard with 28 carries for 128 yards in the win. And Calvin Ridley has five catches for 73 yards. My key takeaways for this game uh, for the Patriots, it, it comes down to the turnover battle. You can't lose the turnover battle every single week and expect to be winning these games. This was a, a game where you matched up against the opponent pretty darn well. And, yeah, every opportunity that you had to win this game, you know, there was, there was just there was a turnover in the first half, turnover in the second half, turnover in overtime. You're constantly shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and, you know, part of that is credit to this Titans defense. You gotta hand it off, or you gotta tip your hat to them. They did not allow the Patriots to get comfortable at any point in this game, constantly forcing three and outs, short drives. Even when the Patriots were able to score, it was on like a broken last final second play at the end of the game, at the very start of the second quarter, and they didn't let them get into rhythm at any point. So three turnovers caused and just a low scoring affair. Good job at the Titans defense. After that, we've got a matchup between the Washington Commanders and the New York Giants, an NFC East battle. In this game, the Commanders would come away victorious once again over the Giants with a final score of 27 to 22. Here we had Jaden Daniels go 15 of 22 for 209 yards and two touchdowns. Chris Rodriguez leading the backfield with 11 carries for 52 yards, and Noah Brown leading all wide receivers with five catches for 60 yards. For the Giants, we've got Daniel Jones going 20 of 26 for 174 and two touchdowns. Tyrone Tracy Jr. leading the backfield with 16 carries for 66 yards, and Malik Neighbors with nine catches for 59 yards for the Giants wideouts. My key takeaways in this game, Number one, for the Commanders, I gotta credit the time management, honestly. Uh, you scored 21 of your points in this game, all in the first half, and after that, it was really just dedication to bleeding out the clock, and they did a wonderful job at it. Long play, like 13, 14 play drives to waste time, and topping it off with a field goal. That is really a veteran team. Obviously, any team can do it, but to be in week nine, knowing that you have such a lead and just playing conserv conservatively to, you know, keep everyone healthy, just advance. Very smart. And, uh, yeah. You, you have 
have to admire the <laughs> the safe play, I guess. Uh, and for the Giants, I, I it's not even really a takeaway. It is just an observation. The Giants are allergic to winning at MetLife uh, Stadium. They, they just can't do it. They are 0-5 this year. They are the worst of any team. They have played five games at home and not won a single one of them. I think that is tied for the most games played at home, and it is also tied for the most losses at home. Uh, truly unbelievable how bad they play on their own home field. I don't know what's up with that, but they play on the road next week, so maybe it'll be a little bit better for them. Next up, we've got a match of for the NFC South, uh, for the bottom of the NFC South, between the New Orleans Saints and the Carolina Panthers. This game would be determined by just one point at the end of it, uh, and it would go in favor of the Panthers. They win this game 23-22 to over the Saints. Uh, yeah, truly shocking in my opinion. Derek Carr goes 18 of 31 for 236 yards and a touchdown. Alvin Kamara with 29 carries for 155 yards and also 6 catches for 60 yards to lead the Saints. Bryce Young goes 16 of 26 for 171, 1 touchdown and 1 interception. Chubb Hubbard has 15 carries for 72 yards and 2 touchdowns. And uh, Jadavion Sanders with 4 catches for 87 yards leading the wideout group. Uh, if you are the Saints, my takeaway from this game is, yikes, I, I've never seen a team outperform another team by this much and still lose. You won the turnover battle, you outgained the opposing team by over 150 points, ah, uh, sorry, 150 yards, and, wait, 150, yeah, yeah, well over 150 yards, and you still lost, and the only thing I really can point out is your red zone production. You went 2 of 4 in the red zone. The Panthers went 3 of 3. They made the most of their opportunities. You were simply outplayed in the red zone in this one. You're going to be looking back at this game, scratching your head, uh, banging your head honestly on the table, thinking, how did we lose to the Panthers like this? Uh, truly, in a lot of ways, you were the better team, just outplayed when it mattered most. So. They fired Dennis Allen, and I honestly agree with that decision to start off the way you guys did and to be here now. It's it's rough. And as for the Panthers, very positive takeaway. Bryce Young gets his first win in regulation. All of his victories last year happen to be in like the expiring seconds of the game. This is the first time he's ever taken victory formation snaps. And it's got to be nice to see the young gun finally win one on his own accord. Maybe it's not over. Maybe there is still more of the Bryce Young era left for this Panthers team. Uh, but they're obviously clearing house. They're not building up for him anymore. They just got rid of Jonathan Minka. They got rid of Deontay Johnson a week back. They have obviously given up on him. But we'll see if he can win another one. After that, we're going to talk about the Broncos versus the Ravens. A game between two 5-3 and three teams entering it. Uh, but it went heavily in favor of the Ravens as they took down the Broncos 41-10 to in this game. Here we had Bo Nix going 19 of 33 for 223 yards for, and one interception. Lamar Jackson goes, sorry, uh, Javante Williams goes 12 carries for 42 yards. And Cortland Sutton with a big day, 7 catches for 122 yards. Lamar Jackson on the other side of the field has 16 of 19 passing for 280 yards and 3 touchdowns. Derrick Henry, 23 carries for 106 yards and 2 scores. And Zay Flowers with 5 catches for 127 yards and 2 touchdowns. Key takeaways from this game uh, for the Broncos. Yeah, this was, this was the test, and you guys are not quite there, not quite ready to run with the big boys yet. Pretty good at taking down the average team. You even got some good wins against the Jets, the Broncos, and, or sorry, not the Broncos, the Buccaneers. And there's another team in there that I was pretty surprised that they won against. But this is like a bona fide 
contender in the Ravens and you guys are not ready to compete against them, I think that your playoff aspirations are still pretty legit, uh, but it shows that the defense can't be dismantled. Uh, you've, been, you've had great defense, but this was a game where the defense could not do anything. And uh, for the Ravens, very strong bounce back after it. an infuriating loss against the Browns. You do it against a good defense. Doesn't look like you guys have missed a beat. Even against the Browns, you had a pretty solid offensive day, but this cements the offensive juggernaut that you have created. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't be worried at all. Six and three is pretty good. All right, after that, we'll move into a matchup between the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Philadelphia Eagles. In this game, we see the Eagles taking down the Jaguars with a final score of 28 to 23. Uh, in this game, it probably produced one of the cooler clips I've ever seen from the NFL. Obviously, this week, we, we got some great, great catches. Uh, I'm talking about the Garrett Wilson jump man touchdown one-handed in MetLife Stadium. Honestly, like, it's up there with the OBG, OBJ clutch. Uh, for him to turn his body around and grab it one-handed like that, like, very impressive catch. And then you've got, in this Eagles game, the Saquon Barkley reverse hurdle. He, you know, gets the ball, takes it out to the edge, hits a spin move, gets past one defender, and then sees another guy coming his way, decides to like half spin and then fully hurdle the guy backwards and picks up another three yards off of it. Uh, just incredible athleticism and such big balls to pull something like that off in game. I, <laughs> I don't know what compelled him to do it, but wow, was it impressive. Anywho, enough glazing. <laughs> Let's talk about the actual game. We've got, in this game, Trevor Lawrence going 16 of 31 for 169 yards and two interceptions. Travis Etienne Jr. with three carries for 24 yards. And Evan Ingram with five catches for 45 yards. Uh, as for the Eagles, Jalen Hurts goes 18 of 24 for 230 yards, two touchdowns. Saquon Barkley with... 27 carries for 159 yards and a touchdown, and Devontae Smith with 4 catches for 87 yards and a touchdown. In this game, key takeaways for the Jaguars being uh, the... <laughs> okay, I... This is, this is quite a dig, so I apologize if there are any Jaguars fans out there, but it is honestly baffling that there was ever a shot to win this game. You guys played horribly. <laughs> uh, outgained by over 200 yards, lost the turnover battle 3-1, to one, and still, well, I guess you were losing it by 2-1 to one when you had a chance to try and steal the game at the end. And, yeah, Trevor Lawrence throws another pick in a boneheaded throw, uh, throwing to Jarnes Johnson. He launches it like six feet above his head. Nicobe Dean with a, a great catch. And, yeah, you lose the game. But by all accounts, I do think you deserve to lose this game. The running game is awful. The decision-making in the pocket has been definitely been better. Uh, yeah, to the Jaguars, you didn't deserve to win this game. If you had managed to win this game, it would have been a uh, highway robbery. <laughs> and for the Eagles, I, I would say don't play with your food. Uh, nearly blew this game in the third quarter. You have a game that you have a significant lead in, then you give up the special teams, or not the special team, the turnover touchdown, and I believe it was a fumble recovered for a touchdown by the Jaguars. And on the very next drive, you are in the opposing territory, and rather than going for a field goal, you opt for a fourth down play, and then you turn it over on downs. So that's back-to-back, -back, like, mistake-filled drives that kind of fueled this comeback effort by the Jaguars. Uh, honestly, just go for the field goal there. You're only up six points. It makes no sense not to take the points there. It would have been... I mean, Jake Elliott hadn't even missed the kick at that point yet. No reason not to trust him. I feel like, by all means, the points there would have gone a long way. Uh, so just don't get too gutsy in your play calling. And yeah. With that, we move into our next matchup. This was a game between the Chicago Bears and the Arizona Cardinals. One that I got horribly wrong. The 
Cardinals come out and whoop the Bears with a final score of 29-9. Uh, in this game, we have Caleb Williams going 22 of 41 for 217 yards. DeAndre Swift with 16 carries for 51 yards. And Roma Dunze with 5 catches for 104 yards. As for the Cardinals, you've got 13 of 20 passing by Kyler Murray for 154 yards. James Conner has 18 carries for 107 yards. And Trey McBride has 3 catches for 35 yards and a rushing touchdown. Uh, as far as takeaways go, the Bears have regressed. This is like a week 1 through 3 Bears performance. They look not good. Offense is regressing hard. These last two weeks after the bye have not been good. Uh, and it looks like the playoff, obviously you are 4-2 at one point. Playoffs were within question. The entire NFC North was positive. Uh, but with the upcoming schedule and your performance in these last two weeks, it is over. Uh, you're not a playoff team. And other things, I think Eberflus, you should fire him. I have not trusted him. I really thought that at the beginning of the season, I didn't trust him as a coach. His decision making in this game, kind of reminiscent of Todd Bowles a couple weeks ago with Chris Godwin breaking his ankle, uh, really on a meaningless play. You're down so much. Bears down 20 with a minute left. Caleb William twists his ankle. There's no reason for him to be out there. Uh, yeah, so boneheaded decision hopefully is okay, but I would look forward to Eberflus getting fired, if I'm being honest. And for the Cardinals, it is baffling that they are at this record. Like, truly, all credit to the team, to the coaching staff. I don't know how you guys are at a positive record at this point in the season. And at 5-4, and four, I... You deserve way more credit than I am giving you. I think this is probably my most snubbed team throughout the season. At least the commanders, I'm giving them that respect. Better record of 5-4, and four, I'm still somehow unmoved by the Cardinals. I still have full faith that the Rams, the Seahawks, or the 49ers will get it together and win this division over the Cardinals. And I don't know why that is, but I just am not impressed. Um... Uh, I don't hate the Cardinals by any means. I don't mean to dog on them like this, but it is just an innate feeling of... I, I see no real reasons to like them, but I will commend the defense. The defense in the last three weeks has been a lot better. Uh, obviously, last week you play against the, the Dolphins, you, you do allow a close call, but between the game where you limited the Chargers and now you're beating the Bears, you're getting wins that I'm not expecting you to get. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> After that, we have a matchup between the Detroit Lions and the Green Bay Packers. This was for the title in the NFC North, and that title does go to the Detroit Lions winning this game 24-14. Here we had Jared Goff going 18 of 22 for 145 and a touchdown. David Montgomery with 17 carries for 73 yards, and Juan Ross St. Brown with 7 catches for 56 yards and a touchdown. On the other hand, you've got Jordan Love going 23 of 39 for 273 and an interception. Josh Jacobs with 13 carries for 95 yards, and Gene Reed with 5 catches for 113 yards. Key takeaways from this game, we've got for the Lions, uh, got a shout out their defense. Defense stood tall when it mattered, limiting the Packers to 1-4 in the red zone, uh, getting a huge big six at the end of the half, the first half. Uh, really, the defense playing exceptionally well against a good offensive team, a very commendable opponent, so props on that. And for, for the Packers, it's got to be the red zone execution and the big six really the the things that the lions took from you that is the main point where you lost this game uh it wasn't bad at halftime it wouldn't have been that bad at all detroit was up 10-3 you had the ball that pick six really ruins the rest of your game because detroit at that point goes into halftime with a 17-3 lead they don't have to do much after that 
uh, really, that that last touchdown, it was a garbage time touchdown. For most of this game, you're losing by a lot. Um, so you just have to be more careful when it comes to pressure and boneheaded pick sixes, because we've seen Jordan Love do this twice. He did this earlier this season. Uh, I forget exactly who the opponent was. I don't know if it was week one or if it was later, but he was trying to avoid the safety and he threw the pick six. Uh, this one, obviously a very different situation, but you don't want to be racking up point like you don't want to be handing the other team points like that. So just be a little more smart about how you're throwing it when you're throwing it away, things like that, uh, with pressure and yeah, red zone execution. With that, we move into our next matchup, which is a game between the Los Angeles Rams and the Seattle Seahawks, both competing for a shot in this NFC West. Uh, we end up seeing the LA Rams take down the Seahawks with a final score of 26 to 20 in overtime, our second of the three overtime matchups this week. In this game, we had Matthew Stafford going 25 of 44 for 298 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. Kyron Williams with 22 carries and 69 yards. Did he score a touchdown in this game? Oh my goodness, Kyron Williams has broken his touchdown streak. That is also somewhat significant. I did not realize that before. And then in the receiving game, Cooper Cup with 11 catches for 104 yards. Absolutely dominating for the wide receivers there. Uh, as for the Seahawks, you've got Geno Smith going 21 of 34 for 363 yards. I, three touchdowns, but also three interceptions. Then you've got Kenneth Walker with 25 carries for 83 yards and a monster, and when I say monster, I mean monster performance by Jackson Smith in Jigba with DK Metcalf still out. He goes off for seven catches for 180 yards and two touchdowns. And honestly, this day could have been even bigger for him if it weren't for a couple holding penalties and things like that called by the offensive line. Uh, absolutely killed it out there. He was torching the Rams secondary. Uh, as far as key takeaways go in this game for the Rams, I'm, I'm gonna say you are very wide receiver dependent. I know that you won this game, but you need Bukanakua out there for him to throw a bunch and get kicked out and not play the second half. It's going to make it much tougher to win these games. Offense kind of did, like, struggle at times because you didn't have both of your top guys out there. And so when you have both teams, I think when you have both wideouts, you do play your offense at, like, a playoff level. You really can't miss any of these guys. If you want to make the playoffs, both guys have to be playing the rest of the way through. One more entry or things like this. You can't manage to have many more mistakes or bumps in the road if you're trying to make the playoffs. And for the Seahawks, as much as I hate to, to dog on this performance, Geno Smith has to be better in the red zone. He did go for 363, three touchdowns with no DK Metcalf, and that is very impressive in its own regard. But the first red zone interception, that was a pick six. Obviously, changes the outcome of the game. Uh, and then the second red zone interception, the guy was like, not turned the right way. You forced a throw directly into the arms of the defender. It's just two very correctable mistakes. Uh, and either one of them, you take those back, you probably win this game. So, Seahawks are going to be obviously disappointed, but Gino, like, he, he did a lot. He can throw the ball. He just needs to throw it more to his team. <laughs> Too many interceptions on this year. After that, we finally move into our Sunday night football game, which was between the Indianapolis Colts and the Minnesota Vikings. I only got parts of this game, but from what I heard, it was a not a great game. Very sloppy, sloppy football being played. We saw five turnovers in this game, higher than your average. Uh, but here we had Joe Flacco going 16 of 27 for 179 yards and an interception. Jonathan Taylor with 13 carries for only 48 yards. And Josh Downs with six catches for uh, 60 yards. Sorry. And then for the Vikings, you've got Sam Darnold with 28 of 34 passing for 290 yards, three touchdowns.
touchdowns, but also two interceptions, like a Geno Smith light. After that, Aaron Jones has 21 carries for 64 yards, not the most efficient of days, and Justin Jefferson, once again, very impressive, 7 catches for 137 yards. Key takeaways from this game for the Colts, shh, it's not a good one, I am. Um, Truly sorry, but the offense looked abysmal. This was not a good offensive showcase. Shane Steichen makes the hard decision to bench Anthony Richardson in favor of Joe Flacco. Sitting at a 4-4 record, you figure, hey, maybe we have some shot at the playoffs. Let's go with our better guy. Uh, and it did not look good. End of the game. It wasn't looking good. Uh, took multiple sacks in key situations. And... Yeah, if, if it's going to look like this, the fans are going to be really mad because you may as well, if you're going to be losing games, lose with Anthony Richardson. If Joe Flacco looks like this again, I think you make that switch back. Just call it quits on the season. Develop AR because Joe Flacco is like 50 years old, man. You're not going to win anything if you can't win with him this particular season. There's no point in starting him. Uh, And yeah, I, I think this is a harder opponent in the Minnesota Vikings. See what it's like. Maybe give Flacco a two more game leash. See how he does in these next two games. If you don't win at least one of these games, pull the plug on it, call it a season, give their keys to Anthony Richardson, let him finish it up. And for the Vikings, way too many turnovers, man. Uh, I... It's not every day that you lose the turnover battle and you still manage to win the game, but three turnovers is entirely too many. One, you can usually get away with. Three is bad. Like, bad, bad. Luckily, the Colts offense never even touched the red zone, so you didn't have to worry about them capitalizing on any of these. But, jeez, like, get it under control. That is not good. Uh, and finally, we can move into our last matchup of the... Week 9 slate, this was Monday night between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Kansas City Chiefs. It is our final overtime matchup, and it went in favor of the Kansas City Chiefs. They walk away victorious with a final score of 30-24 to over the Buccaneers. Well played game, well fought by both teams. Uh, here we have Baker Mayfield going 23 of 31 for 200 yards and two touchdowns. We've got Bucky Irving with 7 carries for 24 yards. And Kate Otten with 8 catches for 77 yards and a touchdown. As for the Chiefs, you've got Patrick Mahomes going 34 of 44 for 291 yards, 3 touchdowns. Kareem Hunt with 27 carries for 106 yards and a score. And finally, Travis Kelsey with 14 catches for 100 yards. Very big day for him. Key takeaways for this game. Uh, honestly, I don't have much to say for the Buccaneers. You played exactly how you needed to play, and it really just came down to the coin flip. You lost the coin flip, you lost the game. That's how it goes against the Chiefs in overtime. Yeah, nothing you can do about it. I don't really mind the decision not to go for two if I were in that situation against a, an opponent that is much better that you are playing on the road, uh, I can see where the motivation would come for, would come from to go for the two-point conversion, but you have to remember, there was 29 seconds on the clock, the risk of going for two and not getting it, uh, is too high, because you, you kick the extra point, at least it's, at least it is tied. I honestly did not expect the Buccaneers to be able to stop the Chiefs in regulation. That is just how I felt about it. So I would rather you put your defense out there and the game is tied rather than you go for the gamble of the two-point conversion. There's over a 50% chance that you don't get it and now you have essentially just lost the game on this play. I uh, give the defense a shot to do something to limit the Chiefs. Uh, and yeah, you went to overtime could lose the coin flip that was also a 50 50 but i honestly don't i don't hate the decision not to go for two in this specific instance just because you're playing against the chiefs and it's like there's so much time left on the clock if there was five seconds left absolutely do it but 29 seconds they had all three timeouts odds are you're gonna lose anyways so take 
get to OT. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and for the Chiefs, I've been talking on you guys for a while, and it's time to stop hating on my end. This is a testament to how well they can battle through injuries. 8-0, the last undefeated team in the league. They have dealt with a lot. You know, Isaiah Pacheco injury, Rasheed Rice injury, Hollywood Brown injury, Juju Smith out for a couple weeks, Patrick Mahomes going down in this game, coming back up. They really have not allowed the injuries to phase them, to go out and make the moves that they had, pick up Juju, pick up DeAndre Hopkins, pick up Kareem Hunt, and just have all of these guys become instant performers and guys that you can really put the team on their backs. It's it's impressive, and you, you have to just be in awe that after eight weeks they are still undefeated. They they just manage to win these games. They they play. I don't know. <laughs> I have nothing to say really. I I just don't want to keep coming at them with criticisms when obviously they are doing things right. So as much as probably everyone else in the nation that's not a Chiefs fan. I do want to see them lose, but hey, you guys, you're killing it. <laughs> All right, and welcome back to the week 10 waiver wire segment of this video. If you haven't been here before, I will be taking all of the players on the waiver wire that are available in over 50% of leagues, according to ESPN at least, and recommending them to you as for who I think is the best to add to your fantasy football team to maximize your chance of winning next week and in the future. So first up, we're going to start with the three quarterback picks that I've got for you guys. And in order, first up, we have Daniel Jones of the New York Giants. Daniel Jones has sneakily had a very nice performance this past week against the Commanders. He had a three touchdown performance against Washington and that allowed him to finish as the quarterback four on the week, putting up over, what, 24 points it was? Uh, yeah, 24.4 points this past week. Now, I bring this up because this week he gets to play against the Panthers. The Panthers have been known this season for allowing other quarterbacks to go off. They are one of the softer defenses. And, fun fact, Daniel Jones is going to be playing on the road next week, and he has been significantly better on the road so far this season. Playing at home, usually he is not that good. On the road, he is averaging a very admirable 16.5 fantasy points per game, with his only bad performance being against a top Pittsburgh Steelers defense on primetime. So, no primetime game, get to go on the road against the Panthers. I think that Daniel Jones has a good chance of impressing and is available in most leagues, only on 12.4% of leagues right now. Next up, we've got Russell Wilson coming off his bye week. He is currently owned in 21.6% of leagues, and he plays a Washington defense that I just mentioned allowed a quarterback four finish to Daniel Jones and company on the Giants. Uh, so far, the Steelers since Russell Wilson's return have looked pretty good back-to-back -back wins. He has looked sharp in these two weeks. He also was dealing with an injury, and so the added bye week could help him look even better than he was before now that he's gotten some snaps under his belt. And we have to factor in that they're doing more to uh, progress this offense with the acquisition of Mike Williams right before the trade deadline. So, uh, yeah, with that, Russell Wilson, 21.6% of legs, might want to go grab him. And then, finally, we have the third and final quarterback on the waiver wire list. It is Tua Tagovailoa. He is owned in more leagues, 42.6% of ESPN leagues to be specific, but back-to-back -back weeks since his return from injury that he's had pretty decent showing this past week. Very efficient in a good game against Buffalo. Uh, and in the last couple weeks, we saw him throw one touchdown against the Cardinals, two touchdowns against the Bills this past week, and he now gets to play against the Rams defense that allowed over 22 points to Geno Smith with no DK Metcalf and allowed over 360 passing yards. And if you know Tua Tungabailoa and this Miami Dolphins offense, you know they can go off for 500 yard performances. So I would go grab him if he's available. Next up, we 
we have our running backs. Running backs is one of the harder positions to predict. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try. <laughs> First up, we have Khalil Herbert, owned in four percent of leagues currently. He just got traded to the Cincinnati Bengals. And if you've paid any attention in these past couple weeks, I have been hammering in how I don't trust the Bengals backfield. So I am very happy for the Bengals with this move. I think that this is great. Re up their backfield with more talent. Just have another guy back there who is pretty good. Honestly, Khalil Herbert, when he played last season, the year before, he wasn't bad at all. I, I do respect his game. So good on the Bengals for going out and getting him. I think they've realized that Chase Brown and Zach Moss are not the answer, so he should be getting some touches. Maybe it's not this week, and yeah, it's not a good matchup this week, but I would definitely go out and grab him for the potential for him to take over in this backfield. Oh, or at least split touches with Chase Brown. I think Zach Moss is out. Next up, we have Cam Akers, currently owned in 11.1% of leagues. He was activated for the first time since being traded to the Vikings this week, and he had a pretty modest showing. 7.7 .7 fantasy points on only 8 touches. Very efficient. Uh, and that looks good in comparison to Aaron Jones, who had 21 carries for, what, 66 yards? That is not that good. Um, and yeah, I think that we could see Cam Akers get an even larger role this week, just seeing as the Vikings are going to be playing the Jaguars, and I do figure that they'll be ahead in this game. Uh, Saquon Barkley just went off for 157 yards. No need to feed just Aaron Jones, uh, especially with him dealing with an injury earlier this season. They might spread the wealth, and Cam Akers could see a lot more, like, dead carries, maybe, uh, instead of six. I don't know, maybe wishful thinking, but worth going out and grabbing. And finally, we've got Ray Davis, once again, owned in 13.9% of leagues. He is the Buffalo Bills running back, rookie running back, that has been kind of making a name for himself in the last four weeks. Uh, his touches, they've been low. They, they have not been that impressive, not that involved. But whenever he does touch the ball, he leaves his mark on the game, making an impact each and every week. He has over 10 points in three of the last four weeks. Just went off for like a 50 something yard touchdown this week. Uh, and he is a premium handcuff. If James Cook were to go down, one of those weeks was a 20 plus carry week when James Cook was out with injury. So if James Cook suffers an injury, Ray Davis is the absolute guy you're going to want to have on your team. Uh, maybe he's earning himself more touches. Maybe not. I don't want to extrapolate. But the guy is talented and I consider grabbing him, especially because the running back market is dire. Unless someone gets injured, you really don't have that great of pickings to choose from. After that, we move into our wide receiver room. Uh, I've got three guys for you. Number one, at this point, I've been hammering it in a couple weeks in a row, and you're probably tired of hearing it, but still owned in just under 50% of leagues, 47.7% of leagues. Cedric Tillman is owned in. That means 52.3% of leagues, he is still available. Go get your guy. Uh, he is on bye week this week. I will admit it's not ideal, but in the last three weeks, he has tied for number two in targets amongst all wide receivers. He is averaging 22 fantasy points a game with Jameis Winston in in the last two weeks. He has absolutely taken over this Cleveland Browns offensive passing game with the Elmar Gilbert trade. So, Cedric, Cedric Tillman is that guy. Absolutely have him on your team. <laughs> After that, we've got Mike Williams, owned in 23.4% of leagues. Uh, as I mentioned, he just got traded from the New York Jets, where he would have figured to be like wide receiver four. Uh, Garrett Wilson, Devontae Adams, Alan Lazard, all on the depth chart ahead of him. Even with Lazard out on IR, Williams wasn't getting a lot of usage. They flip him. And now he goes on to the Steelers team where he could be wide receiver too. I, I think that's very possible, very in the cards for him, obviously behind George Pickens, but I think this is a wide receiver archetype that Russell Wilson does like. He likes to throw those high arcing moon beam uh, deep passes, 50-50 type catch balls, high pointing balls, and Mike Williams is very good at that. Uh, so I think Sorry, all my roommates are arguing about if another roommate should vote or not, so I 
hearing them through the walls. Anywho, I think that this is a good addition for the Steelers. Russell Wilson likes to throw the kinds of balls that uh, Mike Williams likes to catch. Pause. And I think they've got a great schedule coming up with Washington, Baltimore, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. Those are four very throwable defenses. Even if he doesn't make his impact this week, uh, might be worth getting him before they play Baltimore, who has a pass funnel defense. And then after that, we've got uh, our third option, Ricky Pearsall, who owned in 18.2% of leagues. He played a solid game before the 49ers bye week, uh, scoring 11.7 fantasy points. And then he is going to be playing the Buccaneers this week, who are allowing opposing quarterbacks to go absolutely berserk. Uh, you saw what they allowed Mahomes three touchdowns this week, wide receiver three finish, or sorry, quarterback three finish on the week. Uh, before that, we've seen Kirk Cousins do them dirty a couple times. Lamar Jackson absolutely light them up. Uh, all these guys having a day against the Buccaneers. And so I think Brock Purdy is going to have a nice one as well. And this 49ers wide receiver room is still a bit banged up with Juwan Jennings and uh, Debo Samuel recovering from injury, bringing a yoke out for the year. Go get Ricky in a favorable matchup. Now, after that... We've got our tight end additions for the week. Uh, number one, Mike Gusecki. I recommended him last week. One of the ones that panned out kind of in my favor. Uh, he is owned in 10.9% of leagues, and he finished as the tight end one last week. So, shows that sometimes you have to bet on injury. Really, all three of the guys I recommended last week were injury dependent, and this is one that panned out. Finished as number one tight end. And he plays against that pass funnel Ravens defense that I've been talking about. So, should be airing it out. Joe Burrow will be. And as long as T. Higgins is out, have Mike Gusecki on your team, really. He is worth owning it when their wide receiver core is depleted like this. I don't know what the injury status is on T. Higgins, but if he misses Thursday, it's a short week. He probably can miss this game. And if he does, start Gusecki. After that, we've got Hunter Henry. He has been on this a couple of different times at this point, but he's owned in 40.7% of leagues and currently averaging seven targets a game with Drake May in at quarterback. That's, I think, in the top six, top seven of all tight ends in this in that time frame. And he is also averaging 13 points per game in that stretch. Very respectable. Tight end is one of the more dire spots. He's not a flashy ad. He's probably, he's on one of the worst offenses in football. But he has been producing week in and week out. And yeah, not an ideal situation against the Bears this week. But worth rostering at a thin, thin position. And finally, after that, we have our reach candidate. This is going to be Jono Smith, owned in 12.9% of leagues. He's seen 12 targets over the last two weeks, which isn't a ton, but it is solid volume uh, with Tua Tonga by Law back in. And the biggest proponent in favor of this is the fact that they're playing the Rams, and the Rams just allowed 363 passing yards, as I mentioned. So, uh, you know figure that Tua can't throw the ball around a lot. He will throw to Jalen Mahano, he'll throw to Tyreek Hill. He could also manage to feed John o. Smith. Maybe, maybe, we'll see. <laughs> uh, not a confident ad, but tight end position is thin, so if you're gonna get, if both of the other guys are not available, you can try John. Finally, we have our defense and special teams units for this week. I've got three recommendations for you. The first one does break the rule just by a little bit. I try my best to stay under the 50% owned threshold, but I am making an exception because this is a steal. Owned in 53% of leagues is the Eagles defense, and they're going to be playing against a banged up Cowboys team. A Cowboys team that maybe will be without uh, CD Lamb, but will for sure be without Dak Prescott. So you've got a Cooper Rush led Cowboys offense. The Cowboys offense at its, in itself was dysfunctional, and now you've got a backup running the show. Eagles defense just scored 11 points against the Jaguars. Absolutely go get them if you can. After that, we have the Bears defense, owned in 43.5% of leagues. They're going to be playing the Patriots, and right now, the Bears defense has been ranked number six on the year so far. They did okay against the Cardinals, didn't lose that many points, surprisingly. Uh, depending on how your scoring was, they scored between, like, six and nine points. Um, and, yeah, the Patriots, unfortunately, not one of the best offenses 
they just allow Tennessee to have a solid defensive showcase and they turn the ball over three times so hard to hard to say you shouldn't be targeting the New England playing teams yeah and finally our or one that should be available to all of you, uh, our riskiest one. It's going to be the Giants defense owned in only 4.6% of leagues. Uh, and this is a matchup dependent one. You've got the Giants playing the Panthers this week. The Panthers being led by Bryce Young. Every time I'm going to root against Bryce Young, uh, not, not in a personal manner, but if I am a defense playing Bryce Young, I am going to take those odds. I, I usually like having a defense that is going to be playing against them uh, and even though they, they beat the Saints and they had victory formation and all of that Bryce Young still threw an interception like they're still going to have turnovers this Giants defense does get a lot of pressure I still don't trust the offensive line you've got the leading sack you've got the sack later on your team you're gonna get a bunch of sacks you're probably gonna force a couple air and throws I think that the Giants defense is probably the one defense everyone can pick up this week and though it, it is it is a scary play you'll probably profit off of it and yeah with that we conclude our week 9 recap and week 10 waiver wire thank you all so so much for tuning in uh, if you enjoy videos like this feel free to like comment and subscribe I'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress don't really have that many notes or comments on what's going on getting back into all the work that I missed when I was dealing with roommates with COVID last week uh, but I feel pretty good now feel back to regular health and yeah it's it's election day no real thoughts about that <laughs> they're giving my roommate grief for not voting if you can't vote maybe it's cool maybe it's not it's completely up to you uh, or am I to talk about voting you know <laughs> anywho uh, I hope you all are having a great week and yeah Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. <laughs>